If we are finally going to solve our nation's need to become more competitive space-wise, more innovative in our transport uh, solution set, more committed to the kind of technological breakthroughs we need, we must embrace the new space companies. We must embrace them, the private sector, in a way we never have before. We can't be timid about it, and our president has said that he is not looking for a timid response from NASA going forward into the future, limping along, but something much more aggressive, much more innovative, much more forceful. The mere fact that companies like SpaceX have put their own personal fortunes on the line to build a capability that advances our nation's position in the global frontier of space, we have an incredible opportunity, and they aren't the only ones. We have an incredible opportunity to support and encourage their uh, development by putting the nation's fiscal resources, political might, and space, including entrepreneurial space, forward as a tool of foreign uh, diplomacy to demonstrate our will as a nation to have the kind of production, technological advancement, breakthroughs as we advance and solidify our leadership in space. Will we utilize and more fully support the private sector to help close the gaps we know exist? Will we? How much will we support them? Can commercial space flight be the answer to LEO, low Earth orbit? How exciting would it be to see a bifurcated approach to achievements in space with commercial space flight positioned as the answer to LEO and NASA focused on the full ISS utilization and sustainable exploration beyond? A real, no kidding, public-private partnership. Joining me today to share their thoughts and ideas in this very subject are four distinguished panelists. Mike Gold from Bigelow Aerospace, Dr. George F. Sowers from the United Launch Alliance, Frank Culberson, Jr. from Orbital Sciences, Max Vazov, is that right, Max? Vozov from SpaceX. So let me start by introducing Mike Goh, who will be our first speaker. Mike Goh currently serves in dual roles as Corporate Counsel and Director of Bigelow Aerospace's Washington, D.C. area office. In his position as Bigelow Aerospace, Mr. Gold is responsible for overseeing a variety of activities, including contracts with launch providers, international export control, the company's relationship with NASA, and corporate strategic planning. Prior to joining Bigelow Aerospace in a full-time capacity, Mr. Gold previously assisted the company as an attorney in the Washington office of Patton Boggs. Mr. Gold has also served as a state aerospace business development officer, an attorney in the Washington office of McGuire Woods, LLP, and as a summer clerk at NASA Langley Research Center. In September of 2008, Mr. Gold was appointed by the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation to serve a two-year term on the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, or better known as ComStack. Mr. Gold is a member of the District of Columbia and New York State Bar Associations, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where he founded and served as the first coordinating editor of the Journal of Constitutional Law. And among his list of accomplishments, his proudest one that I know of, is that he is Darren's dad. So with that, Mike Gold. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Patty. And if you're all good, I won't show you any baby pictures. So. Uh, and thank you so much to AIAA for hosting uh, and organizing this event. Uh, as Patty said, this is a pregnant opportunity and very important to start focusing on commercial. So I'd like to thank Klaus and Ross and Craig Day, uh, who couldn't be here. And let me say that I love AIAA events because it's the only time I can get engineers to actually pay attention to what lawyers are saying. So. Forgive me while I relish uh, this opportunity and bring up the PowerPoint chart. Miracle of miracles, it actually works. Um, we are unique 
among the panelists today. And that Bigelow Aerospace, as many of you may be aware, is not a transportation provider. We are a transportation consumer. So if I can put uh, our needs and ideas in context, um, we at Bigelow Aerospace are trying to make happen uh, for crude activities in orbit what's already happened in telecom. You know, at one point only the government had satellites and work communications. Uh, obviously that's changed significantly. Now we have thousands of satellites and that has created tens of thousands of jobs. And we at BA would like to see that happen for crude activities. And the way that we're trying to make that future a reality is by creating expandable space habitats which we believe will dramatically lower the costs of crude operation in orbit while at the same time increasing capability. And that is our exclusive goal at Bigelow Aerospace. And I know many of you may be familiar with the company, but again, for the purposes of context with your forbearance, if I can just take you through a little bit who we are, what we've done, and then that will bring me to the topic of commercial space transportation. The idea of expandable space habitats was actually initially developed by NASA, but like far too many projects that were developed by the agency, it never really got much past the PowerPoint stage. So when we began the development, we had to start with a series of subscale technology demonstrators to actually put hardware together and prove that it could function in space. And that was the Genesis program. The first spacecraft, Genesis 1, while I say subscale demonstrator, was not a small spacecraft by any means, about 14 feet in length, 8 feet in diameter after it was fully deployed, and weighing in at about 3,000 pounds. The company that we selected to launch Genesis 1 was ISC Cosmotros, a joint Russian-Ukrainian effort that is taking Russian nuclear missiles, the SS-18, designated Satan by NATO, removing the warhead, putting on a commercial fairing, and then using the rockets for commercial space launch. Literally a sword into plowshare story. And then just to make my life even more interesting from an export control perspective, rather than launch from Baikonur, we chose to go from Yazny, which in the end is really a active Russian strategic rocket forces base in Siberia, where no previous launches had taken place. So, there was a lot writing on the launch of Genesis 1, and if I can take you quickly to a video of the launch of Genesis 1 on July 12, 2006, uh, these images were taken from our mission control in Las Vegas, Nevada. Four, three, two, liftoff. We have liftoff of the Nepro launch vehicle carrying Genesis 1. The Russian launch went very well. They placed us within 400 meters of where they were predicting us to be, which is outstanding. Nobody could ask for anything better. Aerospace history was made by a local company this morning when an experimental spacecraft blasted into orbit atop a Russian rocket. We've got some great news. It is healthy. It is alive. So. <laughs> Lovely music selected by our engineers, by the way. <laughs> and this was the result uh, of the Genesis 1 mission. Uh, as you can see, it's basically cylindrical in shape. Again, 14 feet from stem to stern. The way that we get these images are there's suites of cameras on the solar arrays. So these are the aft solar arrays facing forward. And that's actually the Horn of Africa going by. Now, uh, of course, you know, one mission does not complete a program. And we at Bigel Aerospace, by the way, we needed to not just prove the technology, like the government might, but for a commercial provider, it's not only important that it works, but that you can build another system quickly, efficiently, and affordably. And one of our greatest victories was not just that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 function, but that we launched Genesis 1 on July 12th of 2006. And by June 28th, 2007, we had Genesis 2 on the launch pad, ready to go, and what I'm going to show you now is a short video about Genesis 2. To pursue his dream, Bigelow had to travel to the most unlikely place, thousands of miles from his Las Vegas home. It's an area never photographed or visited by Western media until now. <laughs> 